it has been a long time since we've had this lit many little technical issue issues and glitches and sound, all this other stuff, which tells me that Satan is trying to throw us off this morning, and this morning is going to be something good. Some of y'all thought it might have been a little awkward when I was up here. I'm going to give you a little behind the scenes thing. The internet and the broadcast was completely down. I had to come up here and stall because Skip's the only one that knew how to get it set again. <laughs> so if I seemed like I was rambling aimlessly, and I was, just saying. This week we're concluding our Joshua series. And there's so much more we could cover in this series. Joshua is an incredible, incredible book. But we need to move on. I encourage you to continue reading through the rest of the book of Joshua in your Joshua journals, writing stuff down. Because, I mean, God has spoken to me just powerfully through this book, uh, as he always does. And I, I know he's been doing the same for you. But, you know, there's a lot of parallels between... Vision is a vital part of the... <laughs> okay. Like I said, y'all... Get ready for something good this morning. Joshua and the children of Israel wandered the desert for 40 years, and they were dreaming of the promised land. They were dreaming of the promised land. And when they crossed the Jordan, that's when they started a new beginning. 40 years, the dream, they crossed the Jordan. Man, it's a new beginning. And of course, when they, they got there, they, they stopped, and they kicked back, and they rested, and they just went, oh, we're good, right? Wrong. No. When they crossed that river, it was just beginning. One dream ended, the next one kicked in. They still had dreams to fulfill. We named this series Dream On because here at Fellowship of the Crossroads, we are in the same base, same place. We've entered the promised land. It's a brand new beginning. I mean, there's parallels. When I, I think of the children of Israel and us, there's parallels. We spent 10 years in our own wilderness. We just called it the Incredible Pizza Building with the bats and the rats and the mold. I mean, it's funny, we were having an elder meeting one time and Skip just, he's sitting there talking, he just stopped. I went, what? Because he, he goes, that was the biggest rat I have ever seen in my life. <laughs> you know, so, so we're running around setting rat traps and stuff. I mean, it was just, we had bats in the building. I mean, literally, Christmas program one time. I'm laughing so hard because if you were ever in that building, we had the windows where the go-kart track was. And during the Christmas Eve service, one of the guys on screen made a joke about being Batman and a bat flew across the room and everybody thought that was awesome. And me and Skipper going, that's a real life freaking bat, isn't it? <laughs> so many people went, that is so cool. How'd y'all do that? We trained it, spent months training it, yeah. <laughs> the funny thing was, is so we're up there on stage. We're up there on stage, everyone's facing us. And through the glass windows in the back, we can see four or five of our people running around with brooms and nets chasing this bat. And I'm going, I'm looking at this is like a scene out of a bad comedy. I mean, it was just, it was nuts. We spent all our time, 10 years in that wilderness. And we worked hard to raise the funds to buy this property with no debt and design our new church home and get it built. And then starting to build it in the middle of a once every 100 year pandemic. And last February, we moved in and we're here. And man, it feels like we're arrived. And we, we set in and it's like, time to, we've accomplished so much. We've crossed the Jordan, we're here. It's time to rest, right? No, thank you. No, wrong. Moving in was the fulfillment of the dream. It was a fulfillment of the dream of this church that we've had for the past decade, for the past decade. We took this summer, we got our systems down, figured out what we needed to do to keep the property up, figured out the, how, to, how things were gonna work. And now is not the time to coast. Now is not the time to put our feet up. Now is a new beginning. This is our next beginning. With one major dream fulfilled, it's time to dream on. It's time to dream the next dream. Because here's the thing. When you fulfill one dream, it's time to start dreaming the next one. And that's the key. When you fulfill one dream, it is time to start dreaming the next one. Time to start dreaming the next one. And so as we move forward as a church, we needed to rediscover and remember why we started this renegade church in the first place 12 years ago at Dodge City and what we're going to do for his glory. T.E. Lawrence said it like this. 
T. E. Lawrence, he's better known as Lawrence of Arabia. He said this way, all men dream, but not all equally. Those who dream by night in the dusty recesses of their minds wake in the day to find its vanity. But the dreamers of the day are dangerous men, for they act their dreams with open eyes to make it possible. See, a dream is just a vision we have in our head. It's just a dream we have, a dream is a vision we have in our head. The key is to set goals to make it reality. We could have named the series Replan, Reload, or anything like that, but dreams to pick a mystery. And it's a mystery until we make a plan to make it a reality. And that's what we're here to do. Two questions I want to ask, and these are the questions that are going to kind of frame this morning. The first one is this. Are you willing to live your whole life without ever experiencing a mighty movement of God in, for, and through you? Are you? I hope not, because that would be boring. In fact, it's a, that leads to a boring, frustrating, and unfulfilled life. And most of the time, if you find somebody that's griping and complaining, or if you feel like your life is boring, frustrating, unfulfilled, you need to ask yourself this question. Are you just going through the motions? Are you looking to see what God is doing around you and joining him in it? Because that's the second part of this. Are you willing to be part of a church who never experiences God doing mighty things in, for, and through her? And yes, the church is a her. We are the bride of Christ. That would be female. <laughs> the mere fact that we're laughing and I have to explain that tells us what we're in today. But are you? Are you wanting that? I, are you willing to settle for a church like that? I hope not. I'm not. If you are, I'm going to tell you right now, you're in the wrong church. Amen? Thank you. But how you answer these questions is going to shape your future and it's going to shape our future as a church. In order to continue to dream on, though, we've got to encounter the dream giver. Before we jump in and do that, let me pray. Father, thank you again for this morning. Man, with all the glitches and stuff going on, you're up to something big because somebody's trying to take our focus off of it. And so we're going to talk about it. We're going to laugh at it. And then we're going to move forward and do what we need to do. Father, again, speak through me. No one here needs to hear from me. They need to hear from you. And today is one of those days that I think you're going to really speak to some people. I know this week through this, this message and this study, you spoke to me. So, Father, just be with us today. Be in this place. Open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts to take your word and take it outside these walls and have an impact in our community and beyond. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, in order to continue this dream on, we've got to encounter the dream giver. Now, who is that? Of course, that is God. God is the dream giver. He's the one that gives dreams. If you look at the story of Joshua, the story of Joshua did not begin with Joshua. The story of Joshua began in Egypt hundreds of years earlier, and it started with God giving a dream to the Jewish people who were in captivity whose homeland was supposed to be in Cana, the promised land, but it wasn't. We find that in Exodus. This is God speaking. Then the Lord told him, him being Moses, I had certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. So this is a dream that God planted in Moses' heart. And he led Moses to lead the people out. And that dream and Joshua being with Moses and listening to Moses and seeing him lead, that captured Joshua's life. And Joshua became the heir apparent to take over afterwards. Because here's the thing, often dreams God has for you and us as a people, they're an extension of what God's doing generation to generation to generation working through previous generations to accomplish his purposes. Fellowship of the Crossroads actually started with the dream and the vision of Scott Weatherford back in 1993 to see a, a church in Victoria that, that lived all for Jesus, that was about relationships. We said relationships are what make life rich and focused on helping people build lives that honor God. I started there with Scott 
just walked in the door one evening, February of 1995, heard that vision and I caught it. I caught it. I caught it bad. In 2000, I went to seminary specifically to get trained on small groups and other ministry so that I could come back to that church with Scott in the time, come back to my hometown to make a difference and an impact because that dream and that vision hit me. This is my hometown. How many of you grew up in Victoria? How many of you said, I'm getting out of this town left and you're back? <laughs> the number of hands that went up is startling. It's like the Godfather. Every time I try to get out, they pull me back in. That's Victoria, y'all. People gripe about it, complain about it, and yet here we all are. So what are we going to do about it? That's the key. That's the key. In February 2006, I came back to Victoria. And then in 2007, Scott left Victoria. I wanted to kill him. <laughs> Went to Florida, take care of his parents, start a new work, what God called him to do. And at that point, it looked like for me, the dream had kind of died. Spent three years in my own wilderness. And in 2009, God started keeping me awake at night with this dream and this vision of the hometown, my hometown of Victoria. The dream that Scott put there almost 20 years earlier. The dream that God gave Scott for this town almost 20 years earlier. And so in 2010, we started in Dodge City Bar. Yes, for those of you who don't know, this church started in a bar. And we relaunched the dream. And that's what it was. It was a relaunch of that dream. And we've been working on it for 12 years in the wilderness to finally get our promised land. And then I got something that Joshua never, ever got. I got Moses back. Yes. <laughs> Here's the thing. Our dreams have to be intertwined with what God is doing, okay? God is a dream giver. We can't run around with our own stuff. We can have some of our own dreams and they usually fizzle out. It's all about God's plan and God's purposes to redeem mankind. And that's what we're doing as a church. That's what we're doing. Because life outside of God isn't worth living, y'all. The plans and stuff we make outside of God, and we can work on them, but it's like they, they, it's that God-shaped hole. They never bring us the satisfaction and the joy that we think they're going to. Fellowship of the Crossroads was founded to reach people that no one else was reaching here in Victoria by doing things that nobody else was doing. At heart, we are always going to be renegades, even with the name change. And so we're joining those who've gone before us. There's a great history in this town of churches and people trying, and we're now in that line. Here's the thing. If we choose to live our, our purposes, God's going to walk away from us. But if we choose to be his church, he's going to move in power. That's the question. Are you walking in your own purposes or are you walking in God's purposes? Because see, the dream from God is not about you. It's not about us. It's not about me. It's about him. And I've had people in this church go, you know, oh, this church is great. So this church is not about me. Me and Clayton were talking the other day about planting trees and stuff out here. I said, it's kind of weird. I said, because, you know, when I was a young man, and my, I love trees. Like, I, I, I mean, even we satchels. Anything's a tree. I like trees. Because, you know, and the reason I don't like to chop down trees or mess with trees is because, you know, it takes so long for a tree to grow. And when you're young, it's no big deal. I mean, you plant a tree and you grow. I remember the neighborhood I grew up, people planting these oak trees. And when I was like eight, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, I go back to the old neighborhood that I grew up in, and those trees are huge. Those oak trees are awesome. And I think those are beautiful. Those are gorgeous. But those things are now pushing 50 years old. And I realized, me and Clayton were talking last week, we're working on doing some stuff. And I told Clayton, I said, you know what? You realize we're going to plant trees on this property that we're never going to sit under the shade of but our kids will, and our grandkids will, and hopefully many, many people in this community will. Because 30 years from now, no one's gonna know that I was here, that I started this, but God willing, this congregation will be moving forward and growing. 
and I'll be a name on some document somewhere that somebody will go, who the heck was that guy? Because it's not about me. It's about him and what he's called us to do in this community. Now, sometimes we have dreams that we believe are for God, and yet they're not happening. And we think, well, God, I thought you'd call me to do this. God, I thought this was going on. God, I thought we were supposed to go this way. I've had that happen a lot in the last 12 years, but it made me realize this, and this is the same thing the children of Israel discovered. Dreams delayed does not mean a dream denied. See, when we pray, we pray a lot, and people will say, you know, well, God always answers prayers. And there's three answers. There's, there's no, there's yes, and there's yes, but not yet. And so he said, like whenever God answers the prayer, it's either no, yes, yes, or not yet. I'm going to give you a fourth one. It's yes, but not in the way you thought it was going to be answered. And that's how most of the yeses are is that we pray for something, we go, well, God didn't respond. Well, we're looking for him to answer it exactly the way we think he should answer it, the way we've requested it. And God most of the time goes, I'm going to answer it, but not in the way you think. Because I have a plan and a purpose. And I see what you want, but this is what, how it needs to be. That happened to the children of Israel over and over again. Numbers 14. Man, they're in the wilderness. Things weren't going the way they thought. Then the whole community began weeping aloud and they cried all night and their voices rose in a great chorus of protest against Moses and Aaron. If only we had died in Egypt. I love the way they complain. Or even here in the wilderness, why is the Lord taking us to this country only to have us die in battle? Our wives and little ones will be carried off in plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? Then they plotted among themselves, let's choose new leaders and go back to Egypt. Now, we do that all the time. God doesn't go the way we think. We start something. God calls us someplace. We go and start it. It doesn't happen the way we think. Why am I even doing this? Stop it. God doesn't always work the way we think. Doesn't always work the way we think. And this was a sad time for Joshua. I mean, he was a young man. Moses was still in charge. He's sitting there and, and everyone's wanting to go back to Egypt. Everyone's wanting to give up on the dream. Don't give up on the dream. Don't give up on the dream. Resistance is a tool of Satan. Man, when resistance, when, you, when, you, when you're going the way you know that God's called you to go and you're going down that path and all of a sudden you have all this resistance, all this trouble, all this junk starts happening, that's Satan, y'all. And so many times just to throw us off and to get us to do something different, to get us to turn away, to get us to turn back, to get us to go back to the Egypt in our life, whatever that is. And instead, that's the time when God will show up and push through, help us push through. But in these times, that's when this unity kicks in. When we were in the Aaron Rents building, I remember we got about 50 people and a group came to me and it was like, Basically, they said, hey, man, it's time to coast. Bart, you, you know, quit doing all this outrage. We need to quit doing this promotion. We got our little 50. We got our good. Your job is to minister to us and to disciple us and to serve us. And I just went, you need some more dis? Because you smoking crack. So you want us to just be our little group, right? Well, yeah, we got our little group. I said, so basically, you want to tell the rest of this community to go to hell. Well, that's not what we're saying. That's exactly what you're saying. As long as we've got room for one more chair, we're going to add one more chair because that chair can be occupied per, by a person. That person represents an individual who has an eternal destiny and they're going to spend it in one of two places, in heaven with Jesus Christ or in hell apart from him. And as long as there is one person in this community that doesn't know Jesus, and as long as we've got room to put one more chair, we're going to put one more chair. We're going to go after that one person that doesn't know Jesus. Amen? Yeah. Well, what if we run out of chairs? We'll buy more. <laughs> what if we run out of room? We'll build a bigger building. All for Jesus. That's what it's about. Because what happens is, is that God gives people big dreams and churches big dreams, and it's great till they get to a certain size, and then they want to coast, and he keeps giving big dreams, and they stop. Because when it's funny, when you're small and you don't have much, it's easy to have big faith because you don't have anything to lose. When you get bigger, it's harder to move forward because you think you have something to lose. 
And that's why it takes an even bigger faith. That's point three. Big dreams require big faith. God put a big dream in everyone. I'm going to tell you this. Listen to me. God's put, has put a big dream in everyone. Everyone. There's something big he has called each of you to do. Something big he's called you to play a part in. But here's the thing. Some of you go, I don't know. Well, if you don't seek him, you're not going to find it. If you don't open your eyes to what God's doing around you, you're not going to see it. If you don't stop and pray and then be quiet and listen, you're not going to hear it when he speaks to you and tells you what it is. And then when many people, he does do that. They see it, they hear it, they know it, they dismiss it. Because the first thing they do is it leads, they go, well, I, I think that's impossible. I think that's impossible. The question is, how big is your faith? Because I want you to think about it. If God's called you to do something, God has called you to do something, and you go, no, no, no I can't. That, that's impossible. You know what you've just said? I want you to think about this. God calls you to do something big. You said, I can't do that. That's impossible. You have just told God, God of the universe, that there's something he can't do. If God calls you to do something and you tell him it's impossible, what you're saying is that God, I don't trust you, you can't do this. I don't know about you, but I do not want to be that person. When God's calling you to do something big for him, do it. When God calls you to do something for big for him, pray a big prayer. Pray a big prayer. That's what we're going to see today in Joshua 10. Let me give you a summary. Last week, Scott talked about Achan. God called the children of Israel to, to conquer a little town. Wasn't it big? It was called Ai. Ai. I had one guy one time go, man, the Bible's awesome. I said, yeah, yeah, it is. He goes, yeah, you know, man, you know, he called Joshua. You know, they were conquered. They were, they were kicking butt, kicking robot butt. And, and I'm like, kicking robot butt? He goes, well, yeah, it said they conquered AI, the artificial intelligence. I'm like, dude. <laughs> Let me have whatever you're smoking because it must be good stuff. Come on. <laughs> Little bitty town of AI. And because of Aiken sin, they couldn't do it. Aiken, they figured it out. They repented. They went. They took AI out. Joshua 8.1, that's what they did. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid or dismayed. Take all the people of war with you and arise, go up to AI. See, I have given it to your hand, the king of AI and his people and his city and his land. So they went up, that's verse eight. They did that. And his fame spread. And the children of Israel's fame spread. They knew who his God was. And the people were scared of it. In Joshua 9, the inhabitants of Gibeon tricked Joshua because he knew they were next. So they tricked Joshua into signing a peace treaty with them because Joshua and the people did not consult God before they signed the treaty. There's a sermon in and of itself. Before you make any big decisions, consult God. Wise decision. They didn't make one. So those people became their servants but there are some issues. But in Joshua 10, the Amorite king, where we're at today, the Amorites, they held Jerusalem. They held a bunch of city-states in the area. And the king of Jerusalem, Adonazek, he hears about Joshua and the children of Israel and their conquest of Jericho and Ai and the peace treaty that they made with Gibbon. And he realized he's next. So he calls four other kings, four other Amorite kings of city-states around there to gather their forces together into one large army to attack Joshua and the children of Israel and drive them out of Canaan once and for all. Joshua gets word of this. He goes to the Lord. This is what the Lord tells him. The Lord said to Joshua, do not fear them for I have delivered them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. And so they followed the Lord's plan. They attacked. They were routing them. They were routing them. The problem was it was starting to get dark. Now, I don't know if you know about ancient war, but you fought only in the daytime. That's why you attacked at dawn and at night you stopped because they didn't have really cool gadgets. I mean, you had guys and you had to see the color of their shirts and the color of their shields. And if you fought at night, there's a chance you could start attacking each other. So man, as soon as it got dark, that was it. And Joshua sees the sun coming down. They're routing them, but they don't have time to do it before dark. And they don't want to end the battle. God's called them to do this. 
Joshua knows God has called them to do this. He's told them the battle plan. This is what he's doing. So Joshua, having the dream and the vision, prays an amazing prayer. Joshua 10, 12 and 13 says, on the day the Lord gave the Israelites victory over the Amorites, Joshua prayed to the Lord in front of Israel. He said, let the sun stand still over Gibbon and the moon over the valley of Ajalon. And so the sun stood still and the moon stayed in place until the nation of Israel had defeated its enemies. Think about that, y'all. The sun stood still. Joshua knew there was nothing too hard for God. He is the creator of the universe. If he wants to stop physics and gravity and motion and all that stuff, you think Thanos' snap did some stuff? (laughs) Sun stands still in the sky, and it stood there until they defeated their enemies. Joshua knew nothing was too hard for God. He dared to believe God was the author and finisher of the dream, and he did. Joshua knew he was called to do big things. He prayed a big prayer. He made a big request, and God answered it. Fellowship of the Crossroads, we had a big dream. I knew we needed at least 10 acres. I started praying for 25. 25 for half a mil. And that was what our budget was. God gave us 60 for 400. big prayer because God was calling us to do a big thing and he blew me away with it. I realized I wasn't praying big enough. Sun stand still. This week coming up, two weeks, October 30th, we're going to celebrate it. We're going to celebrate all that God's done in our 12th anniversary. We're going to have a big party after church. We're going to baptize, baptize people, bring desserts, bouncy houses for the kids, and membership. For those of you who've been wanting to become a member, been talking about membership, be here on that day. And at the, when that day is over with, we'll talk to you. You can join up. Here's a question. What are you praying for? What is your sun stand still moment? And that's the question. The question is this. Again, are you willing to live your whole life without ever experiencing a mighty movement of God in, for, and through you? I'm not. Are you willing to be part of a church who never experiences God doing mighty things in, for, and through her? I'm not. I'm not. What do you need to do? What does your prayer need to be? Because here's the bottom line, y'all. God fulfills his dreams. If God has called you to do something, he's going to happen. It's a spirit thing. It's called the hand of providence. God's plan and purposes are going to be fulfilled, no matter what. No matter the situation, God's plans and purposes are going to be fulfilled. God's will is going to come to fruition. God's plans will come to pass. The question is, is it going to be with you and through you, or is it going to be around you and in spite of you? That's the key. The question is, on a daily basis, who are you going to serve? Who are you going to serve? At the end of the book of Joshua, chapter 24, Joshua ends with a short summary of everything that's happened from Sarah and Abraham through the captivity, through the exodus, through the wilderness, through, through them crossing into, into the Jordan, crossing into the promised land, goes through basically a brief history of all the miraculous things that God has done for the nation of Israel to fulfill the dream that he gave them. And he said, and he challenges the people with this. He says, if serving the Lord seems, but in spite of all this, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. See, everybody, you serve somebody or something, whether you realize it or not, consciously or unconsciously. If you're unconscious, more than likely you're serving yourself, your purposes, your plan, the things you want to do, and then you get frustrated because life doesn't go the way you think it should. You have to be intentional. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Because decisions become destinies. Young people, Decisions become destinies. 
the choices you make today will dictate a lot of stuff that goes there the rest of your life. Now, when you're young, you can have some fun and you can experiment jobs and, and, and things like that. That's great. But man, there's certain things you do. Sex, drugs, relationships. There are things that you do now when you're young but if you make a mistake now, if you're not intentional now, if you don't think it through now, 15, 20 years from now, it can have repercussions. And trust me, when you get older, you see that. You see that. Joshua chose God. Therefore, Joshua used God. Christ said it this way in Matthew, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. God will do the same for you that he did for Joshua if you choose to follow him. So this day I challenge you, choose who you serve. Who do we serve? I want my dreams to be God's dreams, which means on a regular basis, I have to adjust to what God is doing around me. Blackaby had a great study, experiencing God. The whole point of it was basically, instead of doing what you want to do the way you want to do it, and then asking God to bless it, Look around you, see what God is doing around you, and then join him in it. That's the key. Challenge for this day is this. First, what do you need to do? What is it you're doing? What should you be doing? Been the theme this whole time. What are you doing? What should you be doing? What do we need to do as a church family? So we're in the process of, as we move forward, plotting, planning, figuring out, redreaming what we're going to do to reach this community for Christ. What commitments do you need to make on a personal level to yourself, to your family, to God? What stand do you need to take? And there's some issues, some things in your life that you need to stop. You need to take a stand. You need to say, nope, this is as far as this goes because I'm going to choose God's way, not my way. But the last thing is this. What big prayer do you need to pray? What is it God has called you to do that you've been hesitant to do because you're not equipped, you don't feel ready, you don't feel like, like you have the, the, the time, the talent, the resources or whatever. The thing that basically you've told God, that's impossible. What's the big prayer that you need to pray? When you walked in, you were handed a piece of paper. You're wondering what it is, here's what it is. In Jerusalem, they have a thing called the Wailing Wall. It's actually the Western Wall of the original Temple Mount, the temple of the time of Christ. Again, Romans came in, AD, approximately AD 70, destroyed it, knocked most of it down, except for this one real section of wall that still stands today. And today, it's one of the holiest sites in Judaism, one of the holiest sites in Christianity. And today, people from all over the world, they come, they show up, they write prayers on pieces of paper, and they stick it in the cracks of the wall. Because that's their hope. That's why we pray, it's hope. We have the hope in Christ. And so we lift our prayers up to God, knowing that he hears them, knowing that he will answer them. Now it could be no, yes, yes not now, and yes not the way you think it. But we pray those prayers. When we built the wall out front, if you'll notice one side says remember, that's what we use the stones for. The other side says hope. And we were putting the wall together. We put it together in such a way to where the cracks were wider on the hope side because that's going to become our prayer wall. So today, I want you to think about what is that big thing that God is asking you to do that you've been hesitant to do? What is that big prayer you need to pray? So take that piece of paper today. On your way out today, write that prayer down. Write a word down. Write a verse down. Write a symbol down. Anything. Do you have to write it out? Just something that you know that represents the prayer that's going on in your heart and when you leave today stop by that wall would you put that prayer there because those are going to stay there we're not going to clean them out those are going to stay there until the paper fades away remember and hope that's what we have in Christ remember the great things he has done for us in the past and that gives us the hope for our future that those prayers will be answered as well what do you need to pray today Sun, stand still. E. Lawrence. All men dream, but not equally. Those who dream by night in the dusty recesses of their minds wake in the day to find its vanity. 
But the dreamers of the day are dangerous men, for they act their dreams with open eyes to make them possible. Pray your prayer. Find your calling. And then go out and make it happen in the daylight. Don't just dream about it at night. Go out and make it happen because it's what God's calling you to do. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning, for these people, for all that you're doing in the life of Fellowship of the Crossroads and this church. You've called us to do great things. You've called us to continue dreaming. The getting onto this property and this building was just the beginning. And now we move on to chapter two. And so we're praying for you to lead us, to guide us, to show us what we're supposed to do to be most effective. Give us the courage to take on these projects that, that only you make happen. That if you don't show up, we're doomed to failure. But that's why we take them on, to give you an opportunity to show up big, to show off, so that we can go out there and put another stone in that remember wall. To remember the great things that you have done for us. There's some of you here today that today might be the day that you realize, you know what, I've been trying to dream on my own. I've been trying to do everything on my own. I realize that I've been following me and not God, and today I want to change that. And it's a real simple change. It's basically just an act of faith and an act of trust, of understanding that basically you can't do it, that it's not about you, it's all about Jesus. And today, just say, Father, man, I realize that I've messed up. I've been going my own way. I've been trying to do my own thing, and I can't do it. I need the purpose and the meaning and the fulfillment in my life. And so, Jesus, today, I ask you to come into my life and be my Savior. I know that you died on the cross for me to pay the penalty of my sins, rose on the third day, and I'm placing my faith and trust in you. Come into my life. Be my Savior. Help me walk out of this place changed. And live each day for you. For the rest of us, what is it we need to pray? Father, help us see what you're doing in our life. Pray that big prayer and join you in the work that you've called all of us to do. Thank you for the opportunity, Father, we have today to be here, to gather together, to make a difference in our lives and the lives of people around us. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.